Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is episode number 37, the Enough to Keep Going podcast. It's the spring break show. Um, this is a quote unquote special episode, um, rather unique in that you see not two, not three, but four cast members tonight. So I have Agascles with me. How are you doing, Agascles? Good. Pop goes the weasel. And the mm. weasel goes pop. DB's here as well. He's excited. Um, and then uh, we also have Prime. Hello, everybody. I'm very tight tonight, so hopefully this goes well. Hey, his his lower third is working. Agasicles and I couldn't get ours to work, but uh, yeah. that's nothing new. Um, I am Swiss Guard, and uh, for some reason they asked me to host again. So um, tonight's episode with the four of us will be what I hope is kind of a, I don't even know what the term is, biannual times two, <laughs> quadrennial, quadrennial, I don't know, uh, quarterly review show. So uh, we're just going to kind of take it easy and uh, look at the end the state of the industry um, prime kind of pitched this and uh, we're, we, we just want an opportunity to all get together the four of us and talk about something. So um, this week, or we figured, you know, just kind of landscape shows would be a good, a good uh, reason to get together. And um, after we, we talked about it a little bit on our client, we decided that we're just going to break it down by platform. So Xbox One, PS4, the Switch, and the 3DS were kind of bundling Nintendo together, and PC, uh, PC Master Race. So we're we're gonna kind of shake it in uh, by um, going with uh, the. Th we kind of talked about the three biggest news stories, um, and uh, for each platform so far, and th and that's just gonna kind of be a framework. It's we're not gonna hold strong and, and fast to that this isn't really a new show um and in fact the first one uh, i am up with uh playstation and i don't have three big news stories for it <laughs> so uh i'm already um kind of uh throwing a curveball there um going a little jazz uh you know taking it myself but um for me the theme for playstation at the start of 2018 is cruise control so you know there's i i was kind of trying to think back like what big news articles have we had on the playstation really and uh in in terms of like you compare to what's been going on with the switch we'll talk about later and and even the xbox one you know kind of the, the it was just recently launched in november the, the ps4 um they're kind of just doing their thing um you know, uh, one of the the latest things was um, release of a uh, 5.5 version of the firmware on the PS4, which uh, has super sampling mode. So, you know, we've had the PS4 Pro for over a year now, and they had a super sampling mode. Okay, we're going to give you some enhancements, even if you don't have uh, a 4K television, you, you might get some gains for gains for some games. Um, they tried it with uh, slashing some prices on PSVR to kind of to, to get that going. You know, I think at the end of 2017, they said there were over 2 million PlayStation VR units sold, uh, which was more than I would have thought. But, you know, are they really still trying to push that? Uh, I don't know. And the, what really encapsulated this theme for me was this article I saw on Tech Radar which uh, granted is pure speculation, um, just content filler. Uh, we needed something to talk about type thing, but hey, it, it's kind of interesting to, 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 to think about. And that was the PS5. What will the PlayStation 5 be like and when will Sony reveal it? And they kind of just go in talking, you know, how it's going to be a while because you got the pro route still. But the fact that they're even looking forward is saying, Okay, Sony has, you know, they've done their moves for this generation. 
and now it's mostly just we're looking on to some of the next big game releases like God of War, and uh, but there's no there's no real surprises. It's just going to be moving along, and uh, and and that's kind of how I feel. There there was no there was no missteps. There's just there's just not a lot out there. Um, DB, I know you're a big PlayStation Four player. Uh, do you do you have any thoughts? I mean, you also have a you. I mean, you also have an Xbox. You also have a Switch. Has the PlayStation fallen by the wayside for you, or is it you know, is it still so the place that- playing strong for you? The PlayStation's been my dominant console, uh, maybe probably because I picked up the Pro uh, versus the OG Xbox. Uh, I certainly play the PlayStation more than the Switch at this stage. And a part of it, I mean, I, I agree with your assessment. It really is on on cruise control, right? They have a dominant market share. There, you know, depends on what percentage you want to run with, but we're still in a two to one margin more or less uh, for Xbox and as switch is catching up on Xbox in terms of market share for this year, at least the PlayStation still can just be, uh, you know, when we get to E3, it's going to end up with the big name titles there. It's install base is huge. It doesn't have to do anything risky. And I think in some, and and we've talked a little bit about this uh, on back channels is, you know, this, March for PlayStation feels different than last March, right? We had Resident Evil 7 coming out in the end of January. We had Nier Automata. We had Neo. We had Horizon Zero Dawn. We had a huge series of big titles that were coming out for PlayStation because they were still kind of churning things along. And now we've got God of War coming. Uh, but really, you know, other than then price cuts and bundles and a continued, you know, the PSVR bundle and, and price cuts that you're talking about, that those were, they brought them back down to, to holiday prices. They brought them back down to $200 for the PSVR 1. Yeah. 1.0 version, you know, 200 or th- 250 for the, um, uh, the camera <laughs> and the, the Gran Turismo one right uh 350 for the skyrim bundle which is the 2.0 version which has uh h hdr pass through in the box uh so in some ways there some ways those price cuts are really about that they are trying to clear out the inventory of the 1.0 version because they have a different unit uh but i also think it's it's the one piece of hardware that you know when you have that big of an install base other than uh, discounts on your on your console. It's a new piece of hardware that that somebody can buy within the the infrastructure. So so no. In terms of me, I, I know that they're on cruise control, but it's also been my go to console. And maybe it's just because of of what's there. Um, maybe it's because of the fact that I got a PSVR over the holidays, and I've been kind of diving into that and and really enjoying that as a different gaming experience. But it's it's been for me, it, cruise control is is comfortable. So so I, I guess Cleese, you've got multiple consoles, you know, and PC builds, multiple PC builds, you know, does cruise control, does your interest in the PlayStation wane when, when they're just kind of holding steady and and not pushing boundaries or limits or where have you found yourself? Uh, For me, it's, you know, as a, as a gamer, right. From a, in terms of like what games I'm looking forward to buy, it's pretty much it. (sighs) It doesn't matter to me as much, right? It's, uh, I think I was talking to somebody about it recently and, you know, every, you know, every, you know, twice a month I have my regularly scheduled, like buy a new game thing and I either uh, pick the best game that's available on the platform I'm playing on or I go best athlete and I pick the best release, you know, on whatever platform that I have. So um, to me, it's just a matter of like release by release, um, whether or not that particular title breaks out and gets onto my purchase radar. Um, as far as, so so if they're holding steady, that's fine with me as a as a pure gaming consumer. Um, in terms of my own assessment or analysis or feeling about what the company's doing and what they need to be doing, uh, man, it's it's kind of tough, right? It's it's tough when you're the fat cat, right? And you're kind of the incumbent. It's like, well, 
what do you need to do, right? You just, you know, to, to quote a line from a comedian, you know, you just walk in somebody's house and start eating. Like, what are they going to do, right? So, um, but, but I think what I've mentioned before is, you know, Microsoft is definitely not, right, sitting steady. Um, you can say what you will about how they've performed to date, but they are making changes and moves and coiling themselves up for a major offensive um, in the next generation. Um, you know, you can say what you want about whether or not that matters or that's important or how well it will do. But the fact of the matter is that Phil Spencer has been moved to a different position in the company. They are making changes at a service level. They have started a Xbox online division. Um, I know we're going to talk about Xbox later, but but those guys are not sitting, sitting idle. So, so the question is, is, is Sony doing something behind the scenes? They've had a change in leadership. Kaz has retired or he's either retired or moved to be the chairman. I think he's he's vacated the CEO position. So um, does that, and I think he would only do that if he felt like people were prepared um, to, to fill his shoes. And, and and I know he's a guy who mentors and trains and prepares for that. So so the question is really, you know, are are those people that are in those positions now ready to carry the torch and what are they planning for when, whenever the next generation gets started? So um, I was on a business trip last week and uh, you know, there, there's usually some at, at these conferences, there's usually some sort of speaker that they, they get to do some keynote stuff and we got the typical rah, rah, um, you know, take the bull by the horns, etc. cetera. Um, you always have to be improving type speech. And uh, it was also littered with um, references to industries or to companies that I guess, as, as Agascles said that, this is what my thought went to, um, rested on their laurels and were comfortable with the status quo, which was a high bar, but the bar is always being raised. So my thought is um, we, better see something in from E3 or an announcement prior to about service oriented something with the PlayStation. I, I mean, I know they have stuff out there, but it feels like Microsoft, as you said, is really um, pushing to, uh, to change the, the industry coming up. And I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like the PS2, or you know the, the we've seen this before right wasn't the ps2 like the the high end console for that generation and uh you know and then you know the xbox 360 just swept in and and took it over so i don't know db's shaking his head i am i'm shaking my head i'm waiting for an opportunity cuz i think one the i i think most people would argue that the xbox the original xbox was your high end at least at that level right the the playstation was not the the I don't tech think it, spec one. Not technically, but I feel like the. Do you feel yes, like the in terms of base dominant was, market? Right, oh, without right. a doubt, right? I mean, right, the PlayStation right. Two was, oh, you know, it is a record that's, seller yeah, worldwide. Best selling, best selling console ever, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yes, so, console, right? Uh, other than the DS, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Right? They so, weren't able to follow it up with the PS3 as well. No, but because they, you know, and this is what they learned from the PlayStation 4 is, right, they, this was the whole $600, get a second job because we're awesome, you know, the problem. And then they totally went in uh, self-contained box, gamer-centric, right? This is Kaz and Adam Boys handing each other a, a disc on E3 in terms of how to trade games. This is taking advantage of Microsoft's missteps. I think the 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 thing that got me chomping at the bit, what you said, though, was that they better say something about games as a, a, a service platform, right? Like, in some ways, I, I completely agree with you, Glassicles, about where Microsoft is. And we'll talk about this later. But I wonder if if Sony's move is not is not in that direction, right? If, if, if Microsoft is getting ready to step one way and PlayStation Sony is still going to take a different path that PlayStation 5 is still going to be a a box it's still going to be a you know self-contained it's still going to Sony is a hardware company and so that they want to sell you that hardware honestly um that that does i know i said Sony better have something to counter i just i said that as in terms of marketability uh, you know, Microsoft being the new hotness, 
me per personally as a gamer, given my internet connection, <laughs> I, uh, I I much rather have you know my physical copies of discs. But I'm getting old and crotchety. So um, Prime, I know you don't have a PlayStation, um, but with regards to this kind of direction of the industry. Do, do you feel like Sony needs to have some sort of a service model or do you think that if they were, they should take the gamble and say, you know what? Uh, we think we have a good business model now. Microsoft is, uh, you know, chasing rainbows and unicorn farts and uh, is going to be uh, re regret the decision to go in a, in a service oriented direction. That's not a... <laughs> You always, you always got the easy questions there. Um, <laughs> you know what? I, I think they're I think they're they're looking. It's kind of hard to say. I, th I think they're looking for the here and now, and maybe the foreseeable future right now. And yeah, they probably have people in the back, maybe you know, um, looking for you know you know two, three, four years in the future, trying to figure out you know what are we going to do next. Um, but it, it, yeah, it just kind of seems like maybe they're just kind of focusing. The, their main focus right now is just in the, you know, the near future. And, and, um, cause I, they, you know, I don't see anything coming out of them, like, you know, Microsoft Xbox pass or, you know, a Sony pass or whatever they have the, um, was it PlayStation now, or I think that, is that their game service? It is. Um, yeah. Which is, it's pretty expensive. Isn't it? Is it like 40, $50 or I don't remember how, how, like how much it was a month or a year or whatever. $15 a month, I believe. Oh, fifteen dollars. Okay, I thought I was more than that for some reason. Well, I th I think what you're thinking of is the combined price, right? Of of subscribing to both PlayStation is Plus view and, and View, because you have to be a P. I think you have to be a PS Plus member to even to get subscribe to View. So you, so you have to pay the combined cost. So View oh. is the cable network, right? And that you no, don't sorry, have not, to be. No, but now, now PlayStation now. Yes, yeah. now you do, and now is twenty dollars a month. Yes. Okay. And that's that's totally streaming, right? That's just streaming games. Yeah, they don't they don't locally install. It's all based on your bandwidth. Yep. That's their Gaikai uh, acquisition right. from 2010. Well, I guess that's kind of interesting then, because I mean they were kind of first out of the gate with that. And 20 bucks, it's not too bad. I mean, um, it's okay, it's double that Microsoft, but still, I mean, it's only twenty dollars a month. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't know why. Uh, and I guess there really hasn't even been numbers, I guess, on Xbox Pass, like as far as subscribers, at least not that I've seen. So I don't know, like what the, you know, what that ratio is, but it almost seems like Xbox Pass is is doing better. I guess just as far as maybe uh, marketing, I guess, because I see it everywhere. I always see it on, uh, not just the Xbox, obviously, because I'm playing that all the time. But you know, I see it on websites and stuff like that. I've never seen anything about PlayStation Now, like anywhere, even when it first came out, other than like the initial kind of push. Well, it's just that. It's just a hard sell, right? Like, I, I mean, I, I just decided to keep my PlayStation Three, right? It's the it's the first, it's the first legacy like past generation console I've ever kept around, because that is a much preferable solution to me being able to play some legacy games than paying twenty bucks a month for a service when when we all know I struggle to get through, you know, gaming content in a month on some type of schedule, you know. Whereas whereas the, the the overall story is better, I feel like, on the Microsoft side where they are enabling backwards compatibility. Xbox Scorpio enhancements are being are being enabled on legacy games. You just it's just this cornucopia of games that just keep coming in from all these different vectors, right? And now you can sign up for Game Pass. Um, I, I I think you know what 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 Swiss was saying about, you know, he didn't necessarily mean PlayStation needs to do the same thing that Microsoft is doing as far as games as a service. Let's let's not give Sony too much credit, right? Because their online model for the last generation was pretty damn horrific, right? In comparison to Xbox Live, they just got their crap together this generation. Um, and granted, they have a streaming service now, but the likelihood of them going full-blown games as a service on the same level as Games Pass, I think is highly unlikely. Um, but, but I agree with Swiss in that they need to do something to put some heat in their story because right now it does seem very laissez-faire yeah. and they're, and they're kind of surviving on this bubble of enthusiasm from their staunch loyalists who insist that they play PlayStation because of its pretty, pretty wide breadth of exclusive titles. Right. Um, yeah. It's, it doesn't even necessarily have to be 
like streaming. It's just more like what is Sony going to do to to make to, to, to present an appearance or a front of, you know, we're still trying to innovate, we're still trying to push console gaming forward, um, et cetera. But um, I, I guess I guess it's kind of hard though when you're wearing on top like that. I mean, I guess maybe you know Xbox hey man, saw that. IBM had eighty something percent <laughs> of the PC market in the eighties, and what happened? They rested, and then they got undercut by uh, Steve Jobs and yada, et cetera. We know the history, but um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> innovate or die. Um, so I, I don't want to uh, dwell too much on the PS4 because. We spent a lot of time talking about a lot of nothing, <laughs> to be honest. We weren't even talking about the quarter. We were talking about how we saw it going. So um, the next uh, platform we have is going to be uh, presented by Gasicles. He's the one that rounded it up. And I, I feel that there's a lot more actual meat to the news that's been going on um, for this platform. And it's the PC Uh I'll let uh, Gascles uh, kind of highlight his topics and uh, his his news items, and we'll we'll start discussing. Yeah, so I guess um, kind of the same thing that Swiss did. I just kind of picked or just kind of surveyed the landscape over the last quarter, and kind of want to talk a little bit about major trends, big news stories that dropped that are, were indicative of those trends. Uh, so the first thing that, that characterized the quarter for me was that uh, PC gamers are increasingly international and using lesser hardware and software, um, and uh, and I and when I mean lesser, I mean less capable uh, soft hardware or software. So, uh, I'm, you know, Steam always harvests the data for the uh, hardware that you're gaming on. Um, I'm not even sure if that's opt out. Um, it may be. It, it may be. I think you opt. I mean, it may be. It may be opt in. Um, I know that I periodically have to go in and, and push and say yes. You know, send off my hardware data. Um, but uh, but in February of this year, they did their hardware survey, and the number one major thing that they noticed is that more PC gamers um, are, uh, are are joining the army uh, in China. So um, uh, China has always been a pretty large uh, PC gaming uh, culture, but um, up until now, all all U.S. consoles or maybe even just non-Chinese gaming consoles had been prohibited in China. And sometime in the last few years, uh, they dropped that prohibition. And so um, Chinese gamers have been growing for Xbox and PC, and I guess uh, Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo. But that's also had a spillover into PC, um, and more gamers uh, are coming out there. Um, but, but the other interesting thing is, so when you, I mean, China is a very large country, and their industrial complex and technology uh, and 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 overall wealth is large. However, that does not filter down very deeply into their um, into their population. Uh, they are not like uh, the U.S., where we have a very large middle class um, that really drives you know a large part of our consumer based economy. Um, and so you have more PC gamers that are coming into the fold, but they're not running um, the latest hardware as much so as, as U.S. gamers are and gamers in other parts of the country. That being said, those gamers also still um, haven't made the leap. So you have, you know, one effect that I'm going to talk about a little bit later is you have people who are playing on older video cards because they didn't make the upgrade before this whole crypto mining thing started. So they are stuck on older cards and really can't upgrade right now. Um, you also have a lot of people that seem to have... Uh, well, with the, with the influx of, of gamers who don't have access maybe to all of the technology bits and pieces that we have in doing DIY builds, um, you have a lot more people now uh, running older operating systems. And so for a while, uh, the prevalence of Windows 10 uptake had uh, been on the rise. But recently, with this influx of gamers uh, in, in other countries, um, that population has been diluted, and now it's pushed back more um, uh, to the advantage of Windows 7. So we see uh, a lot more Windows 7 64-bit uh, PC gamers than we're seeing um, the increasing trend uh, towards Windows 10. So um, so it's, it's interesting from an aspect of, uh, you know, it, the question is that it always presents to the companies who are manufacturing the hardware and to Microsoft who's pushing the operating system is, okay, well, when 
when people aren't making a rush to upgrade, does it make any sense for us to push out newer technologies when um, we don't even have people playing on, you know, on 1000 series uh, G GeForce cards uh, just yet? Uh, and again, it makes me question this push about from the media of VR, 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 VR. And I'm like, when increasing numbers of PC gamers aren't even running the hardware that would be necessary uh, to make the upgrade. And we're not seeing what I thought would be the major reduction in prices for VR equipment that I would have expected to see going into this point of 2018. Um, the other big news story uh, to me uh, that characterized um, this quarter is uh, the story of Steam is just kind of becoming this uh, story of bitterness. Um, there are lots of problems with Steam. Uh, I've commented that I felt like as we turn the corner into January, um, when they kind of opened up the floodgates and removed kind of the partitioning and segmentation that existed on the Steam platform, about, you know, between games and indie and Project Greenlight and all that kind of stuff. And now you're just presented full force with the entire Steam inventory to the point where, you know, talk about a use case for en enabling AI. Um, and I'm probably giving away a good business idea. If anybody could come up with an artificial intelligence machine learning agent who could crawl Steam and surface the games that are actually worth the crap, um, <laughs> then um, beyond what Valve does, because that's not very effective, that would be a particularly lucrative application. But, um, you know, so so now gamers are presented with this huge inventory of games that they can't make any sense out of. It's, it's really useless as far as discovery. Um, so there's that. Uh, they've also just become embattled and embroiled with also trying to control uh, their the people who are publishing through the Steam platform, um, as well as uh, as as well as you know their public image with gamers. So uh, you have um, you have publishers who are trying to get away with stuff. In this one instance, uh, if we recall, again I think back in February um, that uh, that there was a publisher who. Uh, basically told its employees to go on to Steam and give the game positive reviews in order to encourage um, in order to encourage uptake. Um, you have games who have slipped through their review process and have had to be taken down. You have the community railing against them about uh, whether or not that's censorship. And I, again, I go back to people and I think a fundamental misunderstanding of publishing platforms and 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 publicly traded companies and privately owned company. It's it's not censorship if I decide I don't want to sell something in my store, <laughs> right? It's my store. So, uh, you know, if Valve chooses, you know, not to have certain content in its store and available, then that's their choice. Uh, biggest PC-centric release so far this year, from my perspective, has been uh, Into the Breach, which is a game that I have bought but have yet to play. Um, it is kind of, I guess I would still classify it as an indie release. It's uh, made by the developers of FTL, which is kind of a beloved strategy game. Uh, other big releases so far this year, uh, Age of Empires uh, Definitive Edition, the uh, expansion pack to uh, Civilization VI Rise and Fall, uh, the Battle Royale mode for H1Z1, um, or Hizzy, as I like to call it, uh, Final Fantasy XV, and Warhammer Vermintide II. Now, what do I take away from that list of major releases? None of them are really that major. Um, surprising, I've been surprised by the popularity of Warhammer Vermintide II, um, but we haven't gotten anything really big that is PC centric. Now, what I left off of that list is are the things that have been multi-platform, um, probably the biggest of which is Kingdom Come, um, but that's also gotten off to mixed reviews. Uh, it has a lot of work uh, that development team needs to do to get that thing correct. Um, it's It was kind of a Destiny 2, uh, Destiny kind of play um, that, uh, that, that people aren't quite uh, satisfied with. Um, so, uh, so the last thing again that characterized the quarter for me uh, were, were like I said, uh, you know, the impact of uh, of crypto miners who are harvesting all the GPUs um, and have created a a problem for gamers. Uh, I was really, really aggravated and angry by a statement that I saw from um, one of the C level officers of one of these companies that says, you know, kind of gamers should just get over it and uh, and uh, and crypto mine and pay the higher price for cards and uh, use crypto mining to recoup some of those costs uh, and that they should just suck it up and this is the world now. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, that's not the way it should be, right? Um, so NVIDIA, I think, is trying to do things to improve that. But again, NVIDIA kind of benefits from the inflated prices, so it's hard to tell whether or not their efforts to control this current um, 
playing field are really all that altruistic. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting because, you know, more than a couple times I have teetered on the edge and I've been asking myself the question, what would what would what would my hobby life look like if I just got out of PC gaming? Right? It's it's not. Too, and I'm going to characterize it. It, it's arguably expensive. It, it arguably has a, you know, your be your own personal sysadmin burden associated with it. Um, and there are aspects of my life that would be easier um, by getting out of it. So, uh, you know, this GPU craze, if it's not addressed, could wind up having that type of impact on other gamers. So those are the things okay. that characterize the PC landscape for me. What, what are your guys' takes on it? I'm thinking for me, it's it was definitely the crypto mining, um, only because I had a new build at this time and I have an old card now. Um, you know that I, I think it was my brother-in-law's friend's card that he replaced however many years ago, and he they had it sitting in a closet, but it was better than mine, so I took it. Um, so I know that you're not a huge fan of Steam. But when when you talk about well, is PC gaming worth it? It's it's always been more expensive than console gaming if you want the cutting edge and, um, you know. But I mean, we had PC gaming before Steam, and you know, you you say doing your own sysadmin thing for a lot of people that's not a bug, that's a feature. And can can you? I mean, I guess DB, do do you think that? steam is an impediment or i guess for me like i never use steam as a as my means by which i discovered games like for me pc gaming is bigger than steam it isn't steam it's just steam is a convenience so that i don't have to worry about my discs and i can when i get a new build i just log in i get my stuff back um and i have my cloud saves so uh do, do you I, I for me personally crypto mining is much greater threat because it, it goes to the heart of PC gaming. Enthusiasts like to build and trick out their rigs, uh, and this nukes that. Um, Steam, okay, I'm I'm not using Steam to find games anyway. So, oh, so uh, Steam as, uh, and we talked about this back at the top of the uh, top of the year. Right? So it's nice to come back to it at our spring break show. In terms of, you know, we talked and I brought up some problems in terms of Steam as a discovery platform. Uh, the the sheer scope and quantity of indie games and independent games, I'm going to use that more, in terms of what is released and how undiscoverable and, and buried things get. I think there is a still a convenience of, of having it in one spot, having an update, having it all there. I think I think that there is uh, as a platform to purchase that material, it's functional. As I, I also see a glass of concern and and irritation with it is because it could be so much more than the the chaotic swamp that it it is. Uh, and every time that they've tried to do something with it, they've backpedaled and changed. Um, you know, so I think that there's there's that piece, but it's still a stable platform. It's for for you know just talking about the the problems and the the self admin. You know, the nice thing about Steam is that it it helps with that for people that may not have that confidence of of sitting and and you know think about I think about running running games on a dock right and having to to make sure i booted up the right command line to to get the game running that that you know that that's not what happens on steam i just have to click on the icon to hit play and see who else is playing right i mean it's in some ways it's they're in that same coast mode of, of playstation that they're just they're there they're not doing anything to, to really advance what they you know what they could be I think the other piece uh, that i find interesting from our perspective as e2kg is that when we did our, our year wrap-up show of news, one of our news stories for last year in August was about the the huge spike in graphic card prices. And and that has only continued and and now is getting picked up uh, on a much broader network uh, of, of sites and is also, uh, you know, the fact that it, it's just continuing to be an issue. I think the one thing that it does to to your point, Agassiz, of and, and even Swiss, right? That 
for the first time in a very long time, it's cheaper to buy a Dell pre-made unit than it is to build your own. Because for seven hundred to eight hundred dollars, I can get a, an entire package that will have a sixty, uh, you know, Nvidia card in it. And I can't even buy an Nvidia ten sixty card for less than five hundred dollars at this point. So, so in some ways, it's not a bad time to be. If you don't want to, if you're treating it like a council, right? If if you if you're treating it as a as a hobby and the the tech build aspect of it it is not a good time and it's overpriced and it's you know it's more locked down than ever because of platforms like steam where if if you're somebody who grew up with a council and wants some flexibility or other things you know the pc is is there if you're willing to pay for it so prime uh that I kind of like the way DB phrased that. Um, the The story of 2018 is that the PC is becoming more console like, and would you know, uh, not intentionally, but it it just by the uh, the weight of current events. Um, you know, I, I've so, I've seen some HP Omens out there, you know, for a thousand bucks, and I think they might have a 1070 card in them or something, but do you, I, I know, I know you've played some PUBG on. No, you play that on Xbox. I know, I know you're a Steam gamer. Um, do you do you feel that the PC kind of becoming a console commodity, being forced to uh, because of the way Steam works and because of crypto mining, um, is that like a good thing or a bad thing? I, I, I to me, it's a bad thing because I come from the enthusiast perspective of PC gaming, but do you think that could actually help uh, the PC community if um, it, it becomes kind of, you know, democratized in how you purchase game or purchase the, the platform rather than, you know, a race to have the, uh, the sexiest hardware? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been like a real PC gamer. Uh, I do a little bit of uh, of Steam stuff every once in a while. I might buy something. I think the last game I bought was uh, 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 what did you call it? I uh, guess it's Hizzy, H one Z one. So that was the last game I bought. I was you know a friend was talking about it, so I bought it and I played a few times with him, and I kind of just dropped it eventually just because you know we we didn't have time to play anymore. But um, I, I know Steam, it, it, you know, as far as discover discoverability, excuse me, you know, it's it's really hard. You know, there's so much getting thrown out there. I mean, even uh, but that, that's kind of like on every system is starting to seem like, like even Xbox, PS4, mobile is huge. Like it's the same thing. It's, you know, it's hard as, as heck to find, you know, a great game on there because there's just so much, you know, stuff getting thrown out there. Um, I don't want to call it shovelware, but I mean, I guess that's kind of what it is. Kind of like on the Wii, back in the Wii days, this, that term kind of popped up. Um, but I think it's still a, a good system out there for at least like the sales and stuff like that. You know, um, I guess one of the stories, and I don't know if, you guys didn't see this or not i think within the past week or two that valve is supposedly supposedly going to get back into games so maybe that'll give it you know a big bump again so i mean you got that going you know for it uh and then as, as far as the, uh, the the crypto mining i guess i kind of i don't know if i'm misunderstanding something maybe in, in the story because i guess please you said that you know nvidia and you know the other manufacturers are are are, are uh, um I guess monetizing, not monetizing, but you know, they're they're getting something out of this. Right, but it, right. it, are they coming out from them as a high price, or is it the secondhand market that's that's jumping up the prices? Or both? It's, it's it's the retail market, right? So so Nvidia sells the chips for whatever, and it's and it's why DB said like for for PC manufacturers, you're not seeing that price bump, right? Because because the cro- the cost hasn't increased to them, and fortunately, they're not. They're not gouging their consumers, so they really, really don't have a reason to, because a crypto miner is not going to go buy a Dell with a 1080 GTX in it, right? They're going to buy the card and build their own system that's specifically tuned to crypto mining. Um, but, but yeah, so, so I guess my point is that, well, and I guess, I guess maybe, maybe Nvidia is not getting that. I mean, maybe the retailers are, um, but I guess at the end of the day, Nvidia stock prices are, are enabled by. Um, by scarcity and higher demand, um, 
and somewhere I'm sure that they're getting some some revenue input from the increasing prices. So, so, so for them to do something to deliberately improve this situation, which NVIDIA claims they're doing, they cl they're claiming that they're coming out with cards that are optimized for crypto miners so that crypto miners will hopefully go buy those cards and leave the gamer oriented GPUs alone. Um, but, but, but you have to believe that, that NVIDIA is doing that because they think it's the right thing to do because they don't necessarily benefit from that move financially. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, they, they actually benefit the most from probably just leaving things the way they are uh, and, and trying to increase their own production um, of the gamer cards. But so, so it's to be seen if, if, if the manufacturers themselves are actually going to do anything to alleviate this current situation. Yeah, I mean, it might hurt them in the long run just because, I mean, if you can't get one, obviously no one's going to buy any, anything at all. So, I mean, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that how that uh, works out. All right. So um, next up on the agenda is Prime. And I think he has the rosiest review. Um, definitely the most sunshiny and... Uh, you know, the most family friendly, I think. <laughs> what are we talking about here? Are we talking about mobile? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the Nintendo, of course. Nintendo Switch. Hold on, wait. Days. I have to wait until my timer resets in five more minutes before we can talk about mobile. <laughs> that was one thing we never we didn't put in here. Another, see if Dave was on here. He can, maybe he could have talked about mobile because we would have missed missing that platform. Uh, but yes, I got the Nintendo. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know if it's all rosy, but you know it starts off that way at least. So I got uh, three bullet points here that I'm going to kind of I'll talk through real quick right here, and then kind of deep you know dive a little bit deeper into. Uh, so I'm going to go, you know, our favorite subject is finances. So I'll go over that a little bit. Uh, there's been a couple and actually, I guess, three Nintendo Directs now because there was one today, I believe. There was some uh, indie, uh, it was the Nindies, as they call it, uh, Direct that happened today. And then I will go through just some releases that uh, have come out this past year. So finances. Uh, we had uh, at the beginning of the year a report that uh, Nintendo, at least in the U.S., as far as U.S., is the fastest-selling uh, home video game system uh, that's come about uh, basically in all of console gaming, I suppose, according to this article uh, from Forbes. Uh, so it sold 4 point... Uh, let me get the number here. I lost my, my figures. 4.8 million uh, units in 10 months, in the first 10 months uh, of its existence here in the U.S., uh, which uh, hurdled well a little bit of the uh, Nintendo Wii, which was just under or just over four million units, and then also it had as a combined uh, worldwide sales uh, fourteen point eight six million. It actually had surpassed the Wii U uh, total lifetime sales of twelve point five million within that first ten months. So, I mean, obviously it's you know it's selling it's selling pretty pretty well. Um, uh, so there was one other. Th finance thing I had here. Now I lost it. But um, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's just, you know, a great accomplishment that, you know, it's selling this well. Um, you know, the first 10 months, yeah, they were great. They, we, we had all these games and and um, almost one, at least one major game coming out a month. Uh, unfortunately, it's slowed down just a little bit so far, as, as I've seen here in the first quarter that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But uh, it's still, you know, as far as I know, it's still selling well. Uh, I don't think we've got any numbers as far as the first year, like total year numbers. So we'll have to find out, find that out here maybe in a few weeks or so when um, hopefully the financials, their year of financials uh, come out. Uh, so let me jump to the Nintendo Directs. So there was a mini direct back in January, on January 11th. Uh, like I think it was like 10, 11 minutes, 12 minutes at the most. So I was going through some indie stuff, some, you know, some, uh, um, some more of the uh, the bigger the bigger titles out there. So we had a world the world ends with you final remix is going to be coming out. Excuse me, remix is coming out sometime this year, I believe, in the summer. Uh, we had Hyrule Warriors, uh, which is bringing content from both the Wii U and the 3DS version, put in one you know one big title that's going to be coming out. Uh, we had the first announcement, I believe, it was the first announcement of Mario Tennis Aces, uh, the Mario Tennis uh, series, which is bringing back the story mode, uh, which I guess hasn't been been in there for the last couple of games uh and then we had a the big mario update uh, the balloon world which has luigi pops up in the in the game not as a playable character at least not yet but it's kind of a, a fun little side mode that they they uh they released for i believe it was for free uh where you kind of you go through the world you can be one person going through the world and hide in balloons and then another person comes along and tries to find them 
Uh, I haven't tried that out yet, and I'm not sure if there's, I don't know if there's any rewards or anything. DB, have you tried that out? or any other uh, My guys? kids, my sons have. Yeah, it's it's coins. It, it's oh, lots coins. and lots of coins. Yep. Okay. No moons? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Doesn't okay. add to the 99, 999 moons at all. 99 left balloons. All right, a little 80s reference there. All right, and then the final big... Uh, the final big game that they announced right at the end was Dark Souls Remastered. So uh, that was a big, uh, big deal for, for everybody. Um, and I played back on 360. I, I kind of enjoyed it. So maybe if it goes on sale, maybe I'll, I'll jump on it. But that's coming out this year also. Uh, so then a couple months later, on March the 8th, uh, we had a, kind of a bigger direct. Don't, which had, don't oh, forget about Nintendo Labo. Oh, yeah. I, t- I did forget about that. <laughs> That, yeah, that was something separate. I don't think that that was in any direct, but yeah, we had the Nintendo Labo, um, kind of a maker kind of a deal that Nintendo's doing here. Uh, it's coming out next month, I believe, in April, maybe near the mid end of April, uh, which is their little, little cardboard uh, cutouts that you can pop out and you know make to different. Um, there's like a little house that you can do and a motorcycle and fishing and just a bunch of other things. And I, I, I believe you can, you, there's a there's games or at least mini games that maybe you can create within the software also it's itself. So that should be pretty. Yes. Cool. That was something that was just shown at the most recent event that there's some simple kind of almost scratch type of game programming in there and also some audio creation. So there's, cool. there seems to be a little more to it than just the a mini game collection. Yeah. So yeah, that should be, that should be really cool when it, when it comes out uh, in about a month or so. Um, so then, the, like I said, the next big direct, uh, we started out with some 3D, 3DS games. Um, we had the Wario Gold, which is kind of a, just like a mishmash of uh, you know little Wario mini games that have come out or that, that are going to come out uh, in August. That's coming out in August. We had uh, Luigi's Mansion, which is coming out uh, this year, which is a remake from the GameCube, I believe. Am I correct? Anybody know? Yep. And then... Uh, uh, with the, that's coming out this year too and then mario and luigi's inside story which is kind of a double pack of uh the inside story and i think it was bowser jr no it's just inside story but it's got extra content oh okay was that okay was that new is that new content then or is that yeah i think released? it's almost like what they did with the superstar saga and bowser's minions so there's a couple yeah. extra missions and some some side content okay and that's not coming out until next year, 2019, which I was kind of kind of interesting that they kind of announced it now. So they usually, I don't know, that's just kind of weird. Um, and then just as far as the system itself, uh, we had some Pokemon versions that came out of the, the 3DS, the new 3DS. Uh, I believe there's a, uh, just like one that looked like a Poke, Pokeball and then another one that was a Pikachu and then like a kind of multi, just different colored ones that they've been releasing uh, here and there. I think they had like an orange one and a, like a light blue one. I don't remember what the actual colors were i know they had probably had something specific but uh so that's still i mean it's still selling selling like gangbusters so it's pretty cheap now by get them within you know 100 150 dollars probably with a, like a game or two so um and then as far as the switch on the switch side for the the 3 8 uh, march 8th uh, direct we had sushi strikers uh which just looked like a fun little kind of a i guess kind of puzzly puzzly type game um you had travis strikes again no more heroes which I was kind of surprised on that one just because the gameplay looks a lot different than the original. Uh, the original was kind of an open world. Actually, I think there was two uh, open world game uh, that you can just run around the world. And this one this seems to be like little almost mini games kind of sort of. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see a little bit more of that. Uh, you got Captain Toad, which came out originally on the uh, Wii U and uh, did it come out on 3DS. I don't remember. No, right? Okay. It kind of seemed like a game that might work on the 3DS, but so that's coming uh, to the Switch. Uh, you had Crash, Bandicoot, Insane Trilogies coming with all three Crash games. Uh, that was a big deal. Uh, you had the Fractured But Whole from uh, South Park creators, uh, Matt and Trey. That's coming to the uh, Switch sometime this, I believe both of those are spring. Uh, Captain Toad, I don't know if they had a release date yet. Uh, you had some new Splatoon content. Uh, just some new maps and you know new weapons. They've been they've been doing that now since the release. Uh, but also they have their first uh, paid content, which is uh, actually just part of a. Uh, it's actually a story mode that they're going to be including into the game. And like I said, it's going to be paid. I don't think they have a price yet, so I didn't see anything for that. Uh, so that looks pretty interesting. Uh, looks uh, at least as far as like the trailer, it looked like it was uh, a little bit more beefy maybe than the, the normal Splatoon story mode. So we'll we'll see how how that looks. Uh, 
uh, I kind of just focuses on one uh, special agent, uh, Squid, or whatever they're called. I forgot. <laughs> it's been a while since I played the game. Uh, and then, of course, at the very end, you know, the big, uh, the big, uh, the big reveal. You know, the whole. Uh, oh wait, there's one more thing. You know, we got the Super Smash Brothers little teaser, uh, which I think everybody, or not everybody, but most people might have thought it was just Splatoon because it was just kind of the the squid kids kind of jumping around, um, you know, shooting at each other, and then everything goes black, and you see the the Smash Brothers um, symbol in the background. So, and they show a quick little, you know, thing of a Link and uh, Mario up close. Uh, looks like Link maybe looked like it was Breath of the Wild Link. So we'll see. Uh, Mario looked the same. I didn't see like Cappy on his head or anything like that. So we'll see how that goes. But that's supposedly supposed to come out this year. We'll see if that happens. Probably maybe end of the year with their online service. I think is what. The most of us were, were talking about here in the, the chat. Um, so that was, you know, there was more in that direct, but those are kind of the big the big games that I, that I got out of it. Uh, anybody see anything else that I, I might have missed that you thought was interesting for any of those directs? No? All right. I just think it's interesting that the 3DS is still getting some love. Um, but to, to kind of bring it back to the quarterly review theme, uh this also is emblematic of the ps4 it's just there's not a lot that happened most of what we're talking about is stuff that we're looking forward to um and uh as i think uh, a gas cleaser or, or db mentioned you know last year at this time we had had some solid releases um to be excited about to be to, like actual tangible games that we're we're into i mean ps4 we have the shadow of colossus remake i don't know if we talked about that tonight but uh, um yeah and in, like you said nintendo it, it's you know, they had the big push last year with mario or with zelda and mario and then it's kind of been a little bit quiet lately but so i i'd argue though that that playstation if if I agree with you on PlayStation being on coast mode. In some ways, Nintendo's different. Even though there hasn't been big announcements, there's been a steady stream of of content to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Right? There hasn't been a whole lot of big releases, but what they've successfully done, at least what I think they've successfully done, is is given owners who picked it up over the holiday, you know, the 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 people that weren't day one adopters or or Nintendo diehards, the people that picked it up. In the in the fall and in the holiday season, here's three months worth of different types of gaming experiences: small, cardboardy, big name, or at least semi big name stuff. That shows that Nintendo is still going to be putting out games for the system that they just spent money on. So it's more of a justification, and, and rather than you know, kind of a, a production. At this stage, I, I mean, I kind of agree with you, but I I worry about how long that will last. You know, I'm I'm. This may not be accurate, but I would say I would claim that I'm a, a like, when it comes to a gaming console, I want a meal, right? I don't want a bunch of snacks. Um, and and that's what Nintendo's giving. They've dropped bits and morsels and snacks, and here's a cookie, but it it doesn't feel like a first quarter strategy for a company that boosted their sales figures to what 30 million units by the end of this fiscal year or the end of 2018 um it, it doesn't feel like that aggressive punch you in the face type of offensive so I'm, I'm a little concerned about that i'm a little concerned about where are the big titles coming this year and and why have they not been announced why haven't more of them been announced i, I would i guess i feel like the only thing that's really in the wind right now is super smash brothers um Dark Souls, I think, is a good is a great third party story for the console, um, but I'm still waiting to see if they're holding some other things back that we should expect to see in 2018 to help them meet that. I, I think it's 30 million dollar, 30 million unit figure or, or whatever it is. I, I I know that they've bumped the target sales figures for the second year of the Nintendo's life twice um, now. Um, if if I'm wrong about the number, but I know that they've bumped it twice, and it, it needs to be fairly aggressive. So, yeah, I, th I think yeah. it'd be disappointing if we go through the whole calendar year of 2018 and the only prominent release, like flagship Nintendo franchise, is Super Smash Brothers. Um, but I, I'm I'm holding out hope for more for more announcements coming around E3, but we'll see. Um, does anybody have any other comments on Nintendo or you want to move on to uh, 
to, to the Xbox. Uh, just one more thing, just on the on the releases. Um, just kind of in the in this first quarter, they had Dragon Quest Builders. They had Celeste, which actually kind of kind of came out of nowhere and seemed to be pretty popular and still popular, still in the top ten uh, when I'm looking at their uh, best sellers on their on the system. Uh, you had uh, what I thought was called Faye, but evidently it's called Faya from another podcast I was listening to. I don't know where they get that extra letter there, but uh, you had that, which seemed to do do pretty good. Uh, you have Kirby, obviously, it just came out. And then something that had, I guess, Cleese had mentioned, uh, I think a week or two ago, they have, you know, a lot of adult-oriented stuff that had come out, Outlast. Uh, and then I think one of the DLCs, I don't know, maybe it was the second one that had come out, Bayonetta 1 and 2, and then Payday, which was kind of recently too, that had come out. And, you know, obviously those are more adult-themed and, you have, I guess, the fracture butthole. That's probably more, a little more um, adult coming out, and then maybe Travis strikes again. Eh, it's, I think, that's a little bit more mature, mature game, uh, or at least it was on the on the Wii. So, you know, they, they got a little, a little bit of everything, and you know, like you guys are saying, you know, yeah, there was not. I was kind of surprised that there wasn't a big title that came out on the anniversary of of the Switch itself. So. I thought maybe they might have dropped, you know, dropped something, at least a little something. But it was just kind of like, hey, you know, it's been a year. It's, you know, everything's going good. And then, you know, business as usual, we're going to give you a gluttony of, uh, of indie titles to, to, you know, to play with. But we'll see. We'll see what happens with, with the rest of the year. So our final platform for the night, uh, DB uh, took a look at the last three months in Xbox news. Yeah, so this is probably the thinnest of the the platforms uh, in terms of news, but it's also the one I'm probably the most excited to talk about. Where I have, you know, we just said I spent most of my time on the PlayStation, but the moves and the glass of you you hinted at this before, right? The moves that Xbox and Microsoft have been making are to me the most interesting on the board right now. Uh, where I think the biggest one and it's, it's wonderful that we're recording this on the 20th which is the release of sea of thieves which is kind of their their only xbox exclusive for the quarter uh, but again at this time last year the only xbox exclusive for the quarter was halo wars 2 uh so again it, it's not like they have a year over year uh real problems to try to make up on but the reason that sea of thieves is is exciting is not only because it's a rare game and just a game on the xbox platform but it's their first day and date launch with game pass so back in mid-january that uh, actually toward the end of january xbox announced that their game pass with their download you know their subscription service right as we were just talking about with sony that their subscription service on for game pass on microsoft you do download the game it's not streaming you know that this is and it's been out and around uh, and it's ten dollars a month uh, it was 99 cents a month during the holiday season for one month but what it's done is They've committed to first party titles being day and date and always available on the Xbox Game Pass. So instead of dropping $60 for Sea of Thieves, you can drop $10 and play it for a month. And if you want to keep playing it, you just keep paying your $10. Uh, again, going back to games as a service, but that $10 also means that when State of Decay 2 comes out, that you have that. Or it means that when Crackdown 3 maybe comes out at some point, you also have that, right? I mean, in some ways, if you are an Xbox gamer or if you are a PC gamer, because these these game titles are not only Xbox exclusive, but they're also Windows. So with Game Pass, you could play on either platform. And that's the other nice thing about Game Pass. Uh, so I think that that's, that's a, a key piece there for, for me in terms of, of where Microsoft is, is positioning itself. And that dovetails into really the only other big story coming out of Microsoft, and it just happened in the last month or two, uh, last few weeks, was the announcement of their uh, gaming cloud division in Microsoft. Uh, so there's a new gaming cloud division. This was actually started back at the end of 2017, but it kind of hit the press uh, on last week, May at March 15th or so. So again, tying those things together really positions Xbox in a way that 
if Sony is on, on coast mode for this console generation, Xbox is at the stage of setting up the table and setting the pieces on the board for the next generation. And they've, they've been doing this now probably for a year, uh, where they, you know, or even more, back in March of 2016, that Phil Spencer got out there and said that console generations, as we know about, are going to go away. You know, this was his first big piece. So they've been kind of projecting this, but now we're kind of seeing the first fruits of that as well. So I think that that to me is the most exciting thing that Xbox and Microsoft have going on is is what they're positioning themselves to be uh, coming forward is that it's maybe not necessarily uh, you know a box that has Microsoft on it and maybe it is a box but it's a streaming box or it's a service that you know you're you're playing that Game Pass game both on the box connected to your TV and on your tablet because you're streaming through a cloud service and on your Xbox or on your, your uh, Windows PC, right? And that all of those things potentially because they're cloud-based, you're jumping back and forth. So not a lot has happened for Microsoft, uh, but they're positioning themselves to be ready for what's going to happen next. So the like, last case, I saw you jump in there like you were gonna you were gonna say something and a little bit about kind of their positioning back when we were talking about Microsoft. Do you think that this is uh, right? I mean, is kind of seeding the fact that they've lost this uh, generation that you know they're gonna get the sales that they're gonna get, but they're gonna set themselves up for what comes next. Yeah. Uh, so before I get to well, the reason the reason I started was um, I. So, so my understanding of Xbox uh, Games Pass and its relationship to PC availability is it is it is severely limited. Um, it is only Xbox Play Anywhere games that uh, can also be played on PC, and right now that is only seven games. So that's uh, Gears of War 4, Halo Wars Definitive Edition, Super Lucky's Tale, Zoo Tycoon, Riptide GP Renegade, Halo Wars 2, and ReCore. Um, yeah, so it's, it's Microsoft published games. Um, I don't. I this Xbox Play Anywhere doesn't seem to sync up perfectly with that, just because Forza Horizon Three um, was was crossed by. I, I bought it on PC and it showed up digitally on my Xbox, but it is not showing up here in this in this Games Pass games. And that that could be a mixture. I I think this is one of the things that's going to be problematic from a branding and marketing aspect is it's this convoluted equation of multiple parameters that determines whether or not where the game can be played. Um, they say that these Xbox Play Anywhere games are are, are planned to increase, um, but it's just a thing to be wary of. I think it's because because there, look, there's a huge number of people. I'm one of them who I'm like, okay, if Games Pass games show up on my PC, that that's a whole different definition of what this product is. Uh, that makes it more attractive. Um, but I, I I I I think it's a risky like. If you're going to buy Games Pass, make sure that you want to pay those games on Xbox because what you're going to be able to play on PC is going to be a, a little janky and weird and, and ill-defined probably for a while. Um, as, as far as you know, what what is Microsoft thinking? What's behind this? I, I think, and I've said it myself before, that they've seeded this generation. I, I don't even know if it's so much that as they. I think what they are doing. Um, and, and and one of the things I've been disappointed in in the media coverage of this is like I've heard numerous podcasts. Uh, with paid journalists saying that um, they don't know or understand who Satya Nadala is. And, and I think one thing I'd like to say is if you're a paid salary journalist and you're covering the games industry, you need to understand everything that impacts the game industry and understanding who Satya Nadala is, who's the CEO of Microsoft and how that's driving what Microsoft is doing in the games division is probably a thing that you should know. So um, Satya is a cloud, 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 service, services, services type of guy. That is the mandate he's put out since he took the helm over from Steve Ballmer. This is no surprise to me. Um, it is also, it's further leveraging their Azure uh, infrastructure and backbone because to, to run games as a service, uh, you, you have to subscribe and pay for Azure. So um, when, you, when you're hosting your multiplayer stuff, with Microsoft, you can do that with Azure, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it, it increases the ROI on something they're already investing in. I don't know if it's so much that they're seeding this generation now. I, I think almost the way I'm starting to think about it differently is that they have, they've done the Kobayashi Maru, right? They've done the Captain Kirk and changed the definition of the test. They, they've they've rewritten, their, rewritten, rewritten their competitive playground, just like they did with the whole HD DVD and Blu-ray thing, right? 
they decided we're not going to fight you on the battlefield of what disk-based media takes priority. We're going to change the definition of the battlefield and say, no, what's really more important is digital distribution and download. So yes, you guys won the whole Blu-ray thing, but we're changing the market so that we no longer care. I think that's what they're doing here. They've given up on the definition of what is a console generation and who wins it. They've done that both on the hardware side with pivoting and saying, we're, we're not talking about generations of consoles anymore. We're making the consoles like Windows 10, and you're just going to be in the Xbox ecosystem, and every once in a while, we're going to drop an upgrade to that same hardware lineage, um, which is a slightly different definition, but also we're moving to games as a service. So really, you buy Games Pass, you, you invest in the periodic Xbox upgrade, and we're really just kind of making it like your smartphone. Like if they get the price down, maybe every couple of years you go out, or even not, right, because the smartphone is definitely 500 bucks now um, and higher for a flagship. Um, every couple of years you go out and you get your upgrade so that you can continue to play this games as a service thing on the highest fidelity platform available. Um, and I don't, I, I'm, I feel like I'm almost certain that what Satya is telling them is don't care about console generation eight. That's a, that's an antiquated paradigm and that's not the game we're playing anymore. And to me, that's the exciting part, right? Uh, that, and this is where it'll be really interesting from a, from a business perspective to see Sony is moving in, or it seems to be continuing to move in the same direction that they've been moving in in terms of, of hardware manufacturers. And, and you're right, that Microsoft has just, they've shifted that definition. And, and that's, that's interesting. That's exciting from a, from a gamer's perspective because, uh, one, it potentially means that the availability of more games at a, at a reasonable price with something like Game Pass is very accessible to people. It also means that if... It, from a gamer's perspective that has the potential to own multiple platforms that you can have unique experiences on each of these. And it isn't just, you know, Oh, here's another multi-platform title. We're getting kind of the same experience. It, it moves in two different directions. And it, I think the, the thing that'll be interesting in a year from now is to see where that market actually is. And does the market shift in the more mobile PC games as a service type of direction that Microsoft is hoping to move it in, or does it hang in the generation after generation where Sony seems to be projecting itself? Yeah, I think, uh, I definitely think that from, from the perspective of the quarterly review, everything's, we've, we've all been forward looking with this. Um, but I am much more, I, I agree with, with both of you. I'm, I'm much more positive uh, I have much, you know, a much more positive impression of Microsoft lately than I did probably a year ago. When, like, you know, they announced the Xbox One X, and it's like, oh, it's the most powerful console I ever. That that didn't, you know, that didn't excite me as, as much. It didn't. It, it wasn't, you know, my cup of tea. But uh, just from a outsider, you know, I I don't have an Xbox, but just from an outsider of like, you know, they're trying to like you said they're trying to change the battlefield they're trying to change the game um is, is is interesting from you know history of technology perspective um now i guess my 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 hesitation my, my one question if they do go that route and and whether it'll be a problem is how are third parties for example, like Square Square Enix, for example, you know they they throw out Final Fantasy sixteen. How are they monetizing uh, this games as a service platform? Is the PlayStation model going to be more profitable for the third party publishers? Uh, so uh, that that would be that would be my kind of question going forward. Yeah, and I think you saw some of that pushback when they announced back in January about Game Pass in terms of what does this do for game development? That if if a brand new AAA game can be ten dollars a month, uh, how do you recoup the the millions of dollars that that publishers are putting into that? And and it may happen over the course of somebody's subscription to Game Pass over X number of years, but it's not that you know, one quarter earnings of making sure you drop at the end of a fiscal so that you get big day one releases, right? The, you're paying for it in increments versus in one big chunk. And so that will 
impact third parties. It'll impact developers. It it'll you know it will be very interesting to see how this shakes out as as we go forward. All right, so um, we're about well, we're past our mark as usual. <laughs> uh, so I think we're going to go ahead and, and wrap it up. Um, next quarterly review be probably sometime. It, it's probably going to be the post E3 wrap up show or shows. Um, I think we, I, I wasn't on board at this time last year, but I think you guys, if I recall correctly, you had multiple, multiple shows for it. So uh, that's probably when we'll have the whole gang together again. But uh Next Tuesday or next Thursday, we are going to continue with our regularly scheduled programming. So we'll have E2KG and 30 when we're um, discussing the news of this week. Uh, but for for tonight's show, real fast, uh, rapid fire, prime, spring break pick. What do you what do you want to play if you were you know a college kid in in Bermuda <laughs> and didn't have a job? Uh, uh, I don't know if I'd be playing games if I was on spring break, but. Um... I'm, pr ooh, I'm probably going to have to go with uh, Sea of Thieves just because I, I just picked that up myself because I did subscribe to Game Pass, at least a trial trial wise. Uh, and if, if Sea of Thieves kind of pans out, I might just keep going with it, you know, at least for a few months. And that's the nice thing about the service. Is you can, I could just cancel it and, you know, I don't have to do a big hassle about it. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say Sea of Thieves. All right, I guess, please. Um, will you will you be playing something new or are you going to go on your, your retro PC and uh, play something from you know 2007. Uh, probably both, and uh, just because it's rapid fire, I'm gonna throw out three titles that could possibly be uh, on the radar. It just also so fans uh, or listeners here, uh, there's a way out coming out March 23rd, which is the game from uh, Yosef Ferez, who was the uh, creator behind uh, Brothers, uh, which is the two guys prison break kind of scenario, which has been looking good. So that'll be out. Uh, there's Far Cry 5 coming out March 27th. I think a ton of people will be playing that over spring break, those who don't travel and stay at school because they've got work to do. And uh, here's one for DBQ, Major MLB The Show, 18, uh, drops March 27th. So uh, I might be playing some mix of those. All right, DB, what do you got? So I, I'll go with my my pick from McGlasclays, and and MLB the show is should be coming to my doorstep on the twenty third. So yes, I'll be excited to to play that and talk about that in terms of of what's going on there. But I also as another PlayStation only right today we also get Nino Kuni two, a traditional JRPG, uh, and so there's there's pieces there. So lots of stuff starting to come now. We're hitting the end of the the fiscal year, and we're heading into April where we'll see some bigger releases as well. So how about you, Swiss? What's uh, what's your spring break uh, gameathon there? So I'd, I'd probably have two new titles that I'd be that I have my eye on: um, Kirby Star Allies, just because I know I have a lot of Kirby fans in my household, and it's multiplayer. And then uh, you kind of stole my thunder, but um, I actually beat Nino Kuni, the first one, uh, so I'd I'd probably want to pick up Nino Kuni Two: Revenant Kingdom for the PS4 and dig into that. All right, uh, any final comments before we sign off? I think Prime, you had something you wanted to put in. Yeah, I just had. Well, I just want to thank you guys for for uh, letting us do the show tonight. When I was first thinking it up, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, I want to get it all of sign at one point. You know, it's kind of nice to have all four of us all in at one point. You know, at at one time. Uh, and then it just happened to be, you know, the end of March or near the end of March, you know, end of the quarter. So I figured, you know, let's do something a little bit, maybe a little different, a little bit bigger than just, you know, a normal, you know, topic or going through our game show. So uh, I just want to thank all you guys for for doing this and 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 going through it. All right. Well, it was fun. It's always fun getting together with these three quality gentlemen who tolerate me. So. Um, <laughs> For uh, I guess that'll do it for us tonight. Everyone, um, enjoy spring. Hopefully, you know, unlike uh, some of us, you know, winter won't last much longer. But I know I have a storm bearing down on me right now. So, <laughs> hopefully, uh, we got some we got some uh, some positive weather and some improving moods <laughs> coming down the pike. Uh, everyone, have a good night. We will talk to you soon. <laughs>